Some of us have jobs simply just to work them, to pay the bills, to put clothes on our backs, and food in our bellies, while others have a career, a career that fulfills them, a career that perfectly fits who they are. We put so much of our time into these careers that it's one of the greatest relationships we have in our lives. But what if that career was taken away from you? What do you do when something you love so much is simply taken away? My guest today was faced with that revelation. My name is Crystal Romero. I'm a mother, a retired Army Master Sergeant, a proud council member of the New Mexico League of United Latin American Citizens, 8057, and member of our Sisters Keeper Movement, who is the original organizer of this nationwide rally. Crystal loved her work in the military and was devastated when that career was simply taken away from her. But you can never keep a good soldier down. She is now an activist and has become the voice to the soldiers who can no longer speak for themselves. Today, we have a conversation about activism and the military with Crystal Romero. Uh, Crystal, I wanted to start off talking about um, your time in the military. So what gravitated you towards military life? Uh, what gravitated me was my godfather was a baton death march survivor and he he was my mom's high school principal and uh, my mom was pregnant with me in high school so he helped her graduate high school and then he helped you know raise my mom and help my mom raise me and so oh. I grew up with his stories yeah, I grew up with his stories, and he was always, it was always life lessons, like, all the time, all the time. You know, and as a kid, you're kind of sitting there like, oh, my God, this is so boring, right? But his stories were just so interesting. I mean, <clears throat> he taught me about, like, you know, just, like, resiliency and stuff like that, too, because as a Baton Death March survivor, you know, they endured a lot of torture. So, um his his strength really was what it, I was just like, man, I want to be a soldier. And he told me, I remember I was probably like eight or nine. He says, he told me that I was born to be a soldier because my birthday's March 4th and soldiers always march forward. So he's oh, like, okay. <laughs> I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, you were meant to be a soldier. He's like, that's why you were born on March 4th. He would tell me that all the time. And, um, so I just, I, I believe that and I, that's what I wanted to do. So when I was 17, I was like, all right, cool. I'm of age now. I'm out of here. <laughs> and I joined. So you knew probably like, like at what age were you like mentally said it? Like I'm going to the military. Oh, I was like eight years old. Oh, pretty soon. I mean, maybe. Yeah. So did you know any other women that were in military? Like before you joined? Yes. Yes. Matter of fact, uh, when I was in fifth grade, this was during Operation Desert Storm, my class, my class, uh, we were pen pals with um, a deployed female lieutenant. And she was from where I lived in Taos, New Mexico. She was um, a Native American. And I think I want to say she has some Spanish in her too, um, but anyway. So I was her pen pal for her whole deployment, and she would send me like I still have like the money that she sent me like with Saddam's face on it. Yikes! Um, yeah, <laughs> I still have it, and um, I, she was just so like encouraging, and she would talk to me about we talked about all kinds of stuff. Like, I asked her about, you know, like, how does she grow up? And because she was from Taos, where I was from, and, you know, I grew up in the poverty situation. So I'm just like, what was it like growing up for you? And it was just like having a best friend, except she was, like, 20. She was, like, in her 20s, and I was in fifth grade. So that just further validated me wanting to be in the military because I was like, see, she did it, so I can do it. No, no, like, um... I know in, when I was in high school, I took ROTC for maybe a year, uh -huh. probably less than that because I was very, I very much was asleep a lot in high school. 
So, like, was uh, ROTC something you took? <laughs> oh, I barely remember high school. I was barely I, I, I didn't really go to high school. I was... <laughs> Really? I, I didn't. I ditched a lot, and um, I was a I was a foster kid when I was in high school. So, like you know, I had like three pairs of jeans and four shirts. So I, my foster mom would drop us off, like you know, kind of like around the corner from school. And as soon as her car went this way, I went that way. <laughs> I was like, oh, fuck it, I'm out of here. <laughs> and I just. Um, I did school a lot, you know, because I was, I was embarrassed because I didn't have, you know, nice shoes and nice clothes and, and I just, I just didn't feel, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't fit in at all. So I didn't go. So ROTC was not an option for me because I was never there to go. (laughs) You you wouldn't even know if he was even at your school. (laughs) I'm like, I don't even know if they have ROTC there because I wouldn't know. I didn't show. Oh. And then I, you know, I dropped out at, at 16. I had to because I had fallen so far behind from being moved around a lot between foster homes and group homes. I got kicked out of foster home. <laughs> I got kicked out of foster care. Why? Um, <laughs> well, it's a, it's, it's a, I, 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 You'll have to forgive my laughter when I tell this story because I'm still very proud. But uh, I had come home early. I was about 15 years old. I had, I had come home early from school. I, I don't even know why. And um, I walked in on my foster father molesting my foster sister. She was about eight years old. And my only reaction was... Like, I went to the kitchen, which was not far from the room, and there was a fork on the table, and I grabbed the fork, and I went back in the room, and I just, like, lunged at him. And I jabbed the fork right here in the back of his shoulder, and, like, grabbed her, and we ran outside and ran to the neighbors, and, you know, I was like... I was, I was, of course I was like freaking out, right? Like I had just stabbed somebody, Yeah. (laughs) but I was angry. Like I wasn't, I didn't feel bad, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel bad about it. I was just like, I was so pissed off. And, um, when the, the social worker came, you know, know, of course they were trying to convince me that I may have seen something that I didn't understand or, um, oh, you know, you didn't, you didn't. He he was helping her, you know, like this bullshit. Helping her, and I know, right? Helping her. Wow. Okay. What was he helping her? Was he providing sex education? Like, like what the fuck do you mean he was helping her? But I was fifteen years old, and they were trying to convince me that he wasn't molesting her, right? And at, at, at by that age, I mean, I had already had experience with that, so I know exactly what that is. So. I got kicked out of foster care, and then that's when I got put in group homes. And then that's just like survival of the fittest. Yeah, I learned how to fight. That's when I joined a gang. <laughs> and I was just in the streets all the time. I mean, I was a runaway because, you know, we run away from the group home because it sucked being there. It was like you never knew, like, if you were going to get jumped in your sleep or, you know, the it was a co-ed house, so the boys were always stealing my underwear from the hamper. Like, it was just, it was... I was going to ask was why the, would they would steal your underwear, but I probably don't want to know that answer. So. You already know the answer, because, <laughs> because men? <laughs> so, I, I, I think I have an idea. But now I'm kind of... You might, you might have an idea. Yeah, but like, that's the shit that, you know what? Oh, can, can yeah, can oh, you can dress as much as you want. Oh, okay. Cool. Sorry. I have to ask. Sometimes I probably I should have told you that before. No. Shoot the shit. Yeah, would you? Yeah. So, but anyway, so I I spent very little time in a classroom and you know, from age 14 to 16. So, I just um the state put me through a program like I have a high, it's it's a it, it's in, I don't even think it's a GED. I think it's, I mean, it's just like it's a high school diploma 
and I got it at through the University of Highlands University. And it was a program first for the state for foster kids. So I don't know, interesting, but I, I dropped out. Either way, I dropped out. I wasn't in school and um, I got a job at Dairy Queen and I made some money. I filed for emancipation and I got emancipated because I, sh I showed that I could sustain myself. And um, I was I was just waiting to turn 17 so that I could, you know, make more adult choices, I guess. And a recruiter came to my work. Uh, I was a cashier at Walmart. <laughs> okay. And he's like, hey, you seem real nice. <laughs> you want to join the military? <laughs> I was like, yes, yes, I do. Where do I sign? Can I leave tomorrow? You know, I was, I was ready to go. I was ready to go. So, um, and I loved it. I loved it. I really did. Um, basic training was fun. You know, okay, I, I was okay. A, See, I don't usually hear people say basic training was fun. It was fun. So what? What's so? Wait, what? What about basic training? Because you see it in like movies, or I hear friends talk about it, <laughs> and it sounds like hell. Okay, it is hell. It is hell. <laughs> Absolutely, it is hell. I hated every. I hated every day. Like every day at three fifteen, when the, you know, when you're woken up by flying trash cans and lights flickering on and people screaming, you know, yeah, you tend to not like it. But, you know, I grew up, like, I'm a street kid. Like, I, I, I'm used to all the yelling and the fighting and the threats and the, you know what I mean? Like, people yeah. stepping up to you and all that shit. And, you know, and I was in a, I was, I went through a lot of child abuse as a child. So, like, I had some pretty thick skin coming into the military already. So for me, it was like I needed that discipline because I was such a wild child, you know what I mean? And um, so I, you know, even though I, I didn't, I'm not going to say I enjoyed being yelled at, but it kept me in line and I was able to focus and, you know, take and, and take it seriously. Right. There was no time to fuck around. It was like it was all business all the time. And then as, you know, the weeks passed and, you know, the more people learn about each other um, by like the second week, people who weren't going to make it have already the most of them have already dropped off. And then, you know, you still lose people along the way. But for the most part, you lost them all in the beginning. So you've now like you've got this family bond. You're with each other all the time there and you don't go anywhere without a buddy. So you are always with somebody all the time. And, um, it, and for me, it was fun. Like I was a tomboy. Like I used to ride dirt bikes when I was a kid. Oh, um, I, I had a little BMX bike. You know what I mean? Like I rode, um, uh, dirt bikes. I had a little Kawasaki 250. <laughs> um, you know, I just, I like adrenaline, you know, I, I get adrenaline rushes and that's, to me, that's like exciting. So it was fun, you know, doing the obstacle courses, like, oh man, that stuff was so fun. Um, you know, now people just sit around and watch Ninja Warrior on TV and it's like, I got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> My grandmother so loves fun. that show. And I'm like, I it can't do fun. any of that stuff. And like, you know, in, in basic training, I got to shoot a claymore mine. Right, what that is that? That was fucking badass. A claymore mine. Yeah, that was fucking badass. Okay. You know, they they teach you the weapon system. So, you know, you go through each one. You got to learn how to, like, take apart, you know, your rifle, your, you know, the machine gun, the 50 cal. There's, um, you know, they teach, teach us about, you know, grenades and then claymore mines and, um, you know, and a bunch of other weapon systems. But the day that they were teaching us about claymore mines, the, you know, the drill sergeants were like, okay, um, whoever can get this answer right is going to get to do the detonator and you get to fire it. And, um, and I got the answer right. So I got chosen to go up and do the whole thing. And, oh man, I like, I fell in love. <laughs> I was like, 
this is fucking fun. <laughs> this is badass. And um, so I just, I just overall, I just, I enjoyed it. I did. It was hard. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm only five feet tall. And at the time I was probably like maybe 104 pounds. So it was definitely harder for me, uh, especially when we did like ruck marches. Our ruck marches were, you know, we had uh, 30, 30 pounds, 30 to 35 pounds on our backs. And then like the, the men had 45 and 48, I think. And, um, you know, 12 miles with that much weight on your back. And I only weighed 102 pounds, you know, it's, it took, it did a lot to your body, but, um, I was young. I was young. I was, you know, I was 17, 18 years old when a lot of that development happened. So it just made my body really strong and I was able to do it. I was able to keep up. Uh, oftentimes I would be put in the front because it's always like the shortest person leads, right? Because we've got the shortest legs. Okay. You don't want, a, a, you know, how tall are you, Kevin? I'm six feet. Oh, shit. See, now if you were leading the rug march, I would be running. I would be jogging. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like for every for every one of your steps, it's like probably three of mine. Oh, yeah. Two of mine. Definitely. Yeah. So, so I was always in the front because I was always the shortest. And um, so there was a lot of pressure on me, too, right? Like, all right, Padilla. That was my, my maiden name. Hey, Padilla, like, you know, like. I'd get the eye, like, don't fucking make us, you know, <laughs> take longer than what we need to. So there was all this pressure to just, you know, do things right. And because that's like all eyes were on me. So uh, I think that that helped to make, just to make me stronger as, you know, mentally and physically. And uh, by the time I got to my advanced in individual training, which is AIT, that's the school where you go to learn your specialized job. I had it down. I was, I was very confident in uniform and was very confident in, you know, in being a soldier. And from then on, it's like, it, it, it is what you make of it. You can hate it. Um, you know, you can be resistant and, and you know, make things harder for yourself, or you can take your job seriously and, you know, adhere to the values that they teach us and you can have a really good career and and I I I can honestly say that I, I had a really good career you know up until up until it was you know it, it got <clears throat> there at the end and it just all went to hell <laughs> but for that first 16 years I did everything that I would that I was I had set out to do you know I wanted to be a photographer and uh, that was like the job that I wanted, but my scores uh, weren't high enough because, you know, I mean, that's photojournalism. So, mm -hmm. and I didn't have very much of an education, so I didn't score very high on the ASVAP. And um, so I went in as supply and I worked in supply and I did, but I learned logistics and, um, and about the, and, and I was also an armorer. So I learned the, all the weapon systems, which was really cool too. But after um, you know, my, my first commander had told me, she says, well, if you stay in this, in this MOS, your, um, logistics for at least two years, you know, get some experience under your belt, you know, get the feel for the military, then you can apply to be a, you know, transfer to be a photographer. And, and that's what I did. So after two years I transferred and I became a photojournalist and I did that for two years and that was fun. That was fun, Kevin. Okay, like so I So what do, things were you would, like taking photos of in the army? Um, of all our of training, of um, you know, I would go on the helicopters and I would be like kinda like strapped in and kinda hoisted outside the helicopter so I could get photos of the soldiers that were doing fast roping and I did um uh, I went on an airborne shoot. So, I imagine being an adrenaline junkie, that was great for you. <laughs> that was so badass. <laughs> I loved it. And it's like, how many people can say that? How many people can say that they did that? It's like, I, I've hung out of, you know, I'm strapped in 
I'm just hanging out of the side of a helicopter. Like, it doesn't even matter that I'm however many hundred feet in the air. <laughs> it's like, I was like so excited to capture, you know, the shit that you see in magazines. And I'm like, hey, that's my work. And a lot of my work was published. I was the, um, I, you know, we had a magazine for our state, you know, every, every unit has like a public affairs. So it was cool to see my work in, you know, in newspapers in, I did uh, a lot of marketing for the state. So I designed a lot of the billboards and stuff the, you know, the marketing billboards. Yeah. And then, um, I also di- designed our state national guard license plate when oh. I was 20 years old. And it's still being used today. So if you sign up for the National Guard, they're going to issue you a license plate. I designed that. So, like, it was, it, it was, a, it was a really great experience. Um, I was on assignment as a photojournalist when I got recruited to the Weapons of Mass Destruction Unit. Um, I was, I had attached to them for two weeks so that I could. Uh, you know, photograph all their training and to do a, to write a story about them and do a unit history, like who they are and why they existed. And, you know, these, u- these units stood up as a result of 9-11 because they're Homeland Security units. Okay. They're full-time National Guard Homeland Security units. Okay. I say Homeland Security because then people can understand that we're strictly just for the United States. You know, we didn't deploy overseas. Because there's overseas deployable, and then there's just, you know, within the U.S., people that serve within the U.S. Um, And that's what the National Guard does for the most part. You know, we're like humanitarians for our homeland. But um, anyway, I was on assignment, and the the commander was a colonel. And he was really tall, really funny guy, but, like, real serious. He, um, he's like, hey, he used to call me. Uh, my nickname was a uh, walking tall <laughs> walking tall I, and yet you're five feet walking tall yeah he's like hey walking tall get over here and i was like would you like to join our unit and i didn't even have to think about it i was like you know i had just spent about a week and a half with them and i didn't even have to think about it i was like absolutely yes i do i was like yes yes and uh, Went back to my unit um, and talked to my commander and said, hey, I would like to transfer over to the 64th Weapons of Mass Destruction. And, of course, like, my commander was kind of, like, mad, right? He's like, what? You just got here, and you're, like, one of our best photographers. Are you serious? And I'm like, hey, man, this is an opportunity, (laughs) and I can make sergeant. And, you know what I mean? There's, like, all these things attached to it. And um, he was like, okay, yeah, cool. He approved my transfer. I transferred, and... And then that's how I got into Homeland Security and weapons of mass destruction and um, emergency management. And uh, I was the only enlisted female in that unit for about eight or nine years, like eight to nine years. So and that was like... I'm going to go ahead and start talk about the um, end of your journey in military life. So, because usually I hear like people in military for like 20, 22 years, something like that. Yeah, I did 16 years. Um, my in in 2000 in, in 2010, the the army s- stood up the uh, the SHARP program. That's a sexual assault, uh, sexual harassment and assault response program. And in 2010, I was appointed as the victim advocate. And at the time, I was also appointed as the joint substance abuse program coordinator for the state. Okay, this is like my full-time job. It's not my military specialty. And um, I just, I was, I was put in a position where I needed to call attention to something that was wrong. And unfortunately, um, the personal relationships of my, of my leadership and, you know, the person that I was reporting and their family ties um, it, it derailed my career. So it wasn't even that like I did something wrong or it wasn't that like I, um, you know, I didn't break the law or whatever. It was because I was doing my job 
and uh, I had to report. Um, an Air Force E-7 whose father was a three-star general. So it was kind of like one of those situations where, and I had talked to my commander about it, you know, to, to the, to the Colonel that I reported to full time. And I said, I said, you know, what? it's not right. It's not right that nobody's willing to do anything just because of who they're related to. I said, the, like, that's cool, you know, great, good for her, good for him that they have, you know, a relative that high ranking, but not affect your ability to do your job, or that should not be an excuse for you not to do your job. You know, a lot of people take advantage of that. And, um, you know, it happens everywhere. It happens everywhere. In corporate America, you've got the father is the CEO and then oh, the yeah. son is like the pri- the president, right? And the son's like a spoiled, rich shit kid. Like, I think Biden's sorry. son is in trouble for something now. <laughs> oh, I know, right? Something about a laptop? I don't know. Yeah, it, yeah, that that happens all over. It does. It it does, and and that's unfortunately my what happened to me. That was it, and um, I filed a whistleblower, a, a Department of Defense whistleblower complaint because I was um, facing retaliation and harassment and intimidation humiliation i mean you name it they just they just took their decision making process to the extreme it was kind of like we're not just gonna ruin your career we're gonna ruin your life type of situation and what's sad is that i am exactly where they put me to this day I was discharged for PTSD due to hostile work environment. So my, I have an honor, I got an honorable medical discharge, but I only had 16 years, three months. So I no longer qualify for my army retirement. And that, that killed me. That just killed me because of how hard I worked to get there. You know, like, damn the situation. Like, that shit happens everywhere. Um, but just the fact that, like, these were leaders, right, that not only I, tr- I trusted them, and they betrayed me. You know, they didn't do the right thing. They chose to turn a blind eye. They chose to um, protect their promotions and career instead of supporting me in my decision to, you know, um, counsel my subordinate. And, um, you know, I was, I was the, I was that person's supervisor. And when I asked for them to be moved because they weren't taking their job seriously, um, their job was the uh, prevention treatment outreach coordinator. It was their job to get service members into rehabilitation. And I had a young lady come to me because she had turned to heroin and methamphetamines to cope with her rape. And she didn't want to file a report. Kevin, they never do. Um, so as a substance abuse coordinator overseeing the prevention program, I was able to get her, you know, use my position to get her into rehab. And so then I went to my, you know, my subordinate and I said, Hey, I need you to keep an eye on this, on this, you know, this troop and just give me, you know, I need, I need right. I need a little bit more frequent updates on this person. I didn't tell her why, because of the confidentiality of her not wanting to file a report, but it was her, it was her job to track people that were in rehab. Right. So like she didn't need to know why, she, it was just her job to track them because they were there for drugs and alcohol. So I was like, I need more frequent updates. And not only did, you know, they not do that. They didn't monitor. They didn't follow up, nothing. But when I asked for a follow-up, um, she told me, she's like, oh, she's a lost cause. And I don't have time to be chasing her all over the place and tracking her down. And that just like infuriated me because, and I, I, I 
remember the conversation very vividly. I told her, I said, first of all, that it is literally your job to do that. And second of all, who the hell do you think you are to say that about somebody who's in a drug rehabilitation program? Like, who the fuck do you think you are? And it was that attitude of, well, oh, well, my dad's the general, so I can do whatever I want. That just pissed me off to no end. So I went to my colonel and I said, sir, you know, I've, I've been patient. I've, um, I've done a lot of her job for her because, you know, nobody seems to care. And I, I can't do my job if her job's not done. So I'm often doing my job and her job. But I, I need you to intervene here. Like, I need you to either get on her and she needs to do her job or... I want her moved and get me someone else that's going to do the job. And um, he said, nope. He said, I'm not going to bite the hand that feeds me. Uh, so, so basically, so then, you yeah. got um, discharged for a situation that the Army kind of created for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there were so many things out of my control. Um, and yet I, I was still the one that was ultimately punished for it because, you know, I, I lost my career. I lost my dream, you know, and I was at the peak of my career. I, you know, I was like two, let's see, two, three, three years into being a a Sergeant first class, which is an E7 and there's nine enlisted ranks. So I was at seven and I was, I had just, um, You know, I was completing my platoon sergeant time, so my next position would have been first sergeant. And I was ready. I was ready. I was excited. Uh, I loved my troops. I really loved my job. I loved uh, being able to to even just, you know, getting to know my troops, too. Like, my squad leaders were hilarious. They were hilarious. They made the, you know, I'm talking about, like, the the shit details. Like, the shit details that you just got to do. Like they made it fun, right? Because they would be—they would be the ones that like would be telling the jokes to get people laughing, so that we would forget that we're doing some might some stupid bullshit, <laughs> filling sandbags. <laughs> you know, it's like okay, everybody's got to go do maintenance on the Humvees for the 80th time this weekend. I mean, you know, there's a lot of times that you're doing a lot of things that don't make any sense. Trust me, it is there. But we always we're having fun doing it. You know, there's always some sort of enjoyment out of the hard work that you had to do. And, um, I had a lot of really good leadership throughout my career. I had a lot of, uh, senior people that mentored me and poured a lot into me, uh, sent me to trainings, gave me opportunities so that I could advance, you know, in my career, uh, sent me to civilian schools, when I was in the weapons of mass destruction unit, uh, we would go, we would attend co- uh, college universities uh, to take, you know, like analytical chemistry and you know, airborne diseases, microbiology. Um, we would go to like radiation training in Nevada, and um, you know, just a lot of the training that I received, the opportunities that I had, I never would have seen any of those things had I not joined the military. And um, even my education, I mean, I have so much education, it's ridiculous, <laughs> and certifications. But I made the comment earlier that I'm right where my leadership put me. Because of my disability, I'm 100% disabled, permanent and total. Because of that, I can't collect a salary. I can't get a job, which is why I do volunteer advocacy work. Because... I, I've got all this education and training, but I can't use any of it. All I can do is just kind of sit around and hang in there and, you know, whatever. And, and that's a really bad place for people who have uh, complex post-traumatic stress and depression to be. You know, because I don't know if you ever saw that interview with Chester from um, Lincoln Park. And he said that, um, he's like, this is, the, this is a bad neighborhood. And oh, yes, I've heard that. Yeah, he's like, this is a bad neighborhood, and I should not be left up, up here by myself. And that's that's how, I, I mean, I can relate to that, because 
oftentimes when you just when you have a lot of time on your hands you tend to think and sometimes your mind can take you places where it, you you don't want it to go and it can get real dark so that's the reason why i'm so active in my advocacy work and even with uh, appealing my case i've been appealing my case uh for 10 years actually no eight years i've been appealing it for eight years but i've been going through it for 10 and um now is that normal right oh, oh yeah there's people that will wait 20 years for an appeal you know it's i uh it's like the delay, delay, delay until they die. <laughs> kind of like how the VA um, processes the disability claims. I mean, you've got veterans. Yeah, that's that what I was thinking for, of, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The same way. You've got veterans that have been waiting for 12 years for an appeal for like 10% of their disability. I mean, it's not even, it's like a big jump. And uh, it's ridiculous. It's, 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 it's truly absurd how we have to fight for our comprehensive health care. So, like you said, you um, basically you had all these skills that you learned and don't ha have the ability to use, so it made you lead into volunteering advocacy. So, like, what, like, what was the first kind of um, like situation that kind of led you that way? Um, what led me to doing this advocacy work? Yeah. Um, it was in 2020 when. Uh, spe uh, special Vanessa Guillen went missing. I saw her. Uh, I follow uh, Latinos in uniform on Instagram, and her face popped up on the feed, and I was like, missing. So, you know, tapped on it, and I'm reading that, you know, she's been missing. She was a, she was a supply, gal was supply, and you know, her stuff was found in the arms room, and then they just marked her AWOL. And I was just like, what? Like, none of it made sense. It smelled so bad. And it's like, talk about, like, being triggered. I was just, I was triggered. And I was triggered in a way that all that rage and all that anger that I had, you know, that I carried with me when I was, when I was, pushed out you know I had kind of just compacted it down all that just came out and I used that energy to do the advocacy work for that first two years I mean every day I was working every single day there was not a day that I was not talking to senators or talking to other organizations reaching out to other nonprofits that had jumped on board connecting with all the other veterans who started doing that who, who were who were also triggered I, all of us were triggered i think every female veteran was triggered was triggered you know whether you're active duty or retired or you know you only served two years or you only served for five it doesn't matter it was so relatable because you know i put my myself in her shoes like okay when i was 20 years old i worked in a supply room i worked in an arms room and i'm like there's no fucking way there's no way that that happened that that happened that that happened and i'm just like they're covering this shit up they're doing what they do instead of accepting responsibility for poor leadership for poor decisions made by leaders they chose to just cover it up still to this day there have been no arrests other than that one female the the girlfriend the yeah because actually that's good to know because i i honestly thought like there was probably more because you heard about the girlfriend so i think mm -hmm. the average person would have thought that was the start of a deeper investigation Right, but look, we're 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 still here. What going on three years and nothing, nothing. She's still in jail, trying to get her case thrown out because I don't know. One of her one of her civil rights was violated supposedly 
I don't know, but and and quite frankly, who gives a shit? You helped chop up a a, a soldier. Like you need to burn in hell. Like <laughs> there is no. You cannot convince me that that woman needs, you know, that giving her the death penalty is too much. That's not enough. I, I, I just, I wholeheartedly feel that way. You know, that, that rage that I felt when I was 15 and I shoved that fork into that man, that 40 year old man, that's, um, that's the energy, you know, that, that I had to push forward to, um, to get the Vanessa Guillen case just out to make it known to everybody. Everybody needs to know that story because that story is our story. It's, it's the military story. It's the truth. It's the ugly truth of the shit that we deal with in the military. The harassment is ridiculous. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I honestly did not face a lot of harassment. I didn't. Um, my first experience with harassment was in AIT my drill sergeant on graduation day, he told me that he wanted to fuck my brains out. And I remember just being freaked out. Like what the fuck just happened? Because, you know, I had just looked up to this man for nine weeks. You know, this guy just mentored me for nine weeks. And just like that, all of a sudden, he's like, oh, I just want to fuck your brains out. And he was so nonchalant about it too. And, um, so naturally, I mean, I, I got out. I ran from that situation. I was able to to escape that situation. But not everybody escapes that situation. A lot of times, you know, you get in that fight or flight, and some people freeze. They freeze, and um, so I, I was never assaulted, and. So that's why when people tell me, oh, well, men and women can't work together. Yeah, we can. You know, I was in a unit with 22 men. And I was the only female. And I was 22 years old. I didn't have any issues. I didn't feel unsafe. I didn't feel um, creeped out or I never felt uncomfortable. You know, I felt felt a little overprotected, to be honest. Like, it's like having a million, it's like having five dads and 17 brothers, you know what I mean? And I think that's what, but at least that's what my kind of thought yeah. process of what would it be like being a woman in the military. Yes. Okay. And, you know, that's good. I mean, it's a little annoying and it kind of just ruined my early dating life because, you know, we'd, we'd go to, um, you know, we'd, we'd travel for training and stuff. So, and naturally, you know, we'd all go eat as a group at a restaurant or whatever or, you know, after where you go have drinks to celebrate, like, uh, you know, a long day of training. So, you know, naturally, like, I'm single, and I'm at the bar, and if I'm going to start talking to somebody, don't think my first sergeant was going to be over there staring at me, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and if you got, like, two or three soldiers just around you, it's, it's a little intimidating right? to just walk the up. guy, yeah, <laughs> making the guy that's talking to me uncomfortable. So naturally, he's going to be like, all right, cool, I see you've got a whole fucking security force, so I'm out. Bye. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Now, um, when it comes to, because one part of advocacy is is kind of getting the word out there. Um, Mm -hmm. Outside of like social media, what other ways were you kind of letting, at least like New Mexico, know more about Vanessa Guillen's situation? Well, um, early, um, early on, it was like, I think February of 2021, I was appointed to uh, LULAC's national military and veteran affairs committee um lulac is the league of united latin american citizens it's the largest and oldest latino civil rights organization so being appointed to i was the subcommittee chair uh, for military and veteran uh, legislative affairs i was able to use that platform as a vehicle to get meetings with like the president's deputy cabinet secretary, you know, senators, it gave me access to so many more people. And, you know, their network became my network. 
and I was able to connect with so many people. I started doing podcasts like this with folks like you that were just mm-hmm. interested in like, hey, like we want to like what, you know, and I think everybody was just kind of having a me too moment, right? Because mm-hmm. women in corporations, when they hear us talking about what we go through, they're like, wow, yeah, me too. Um, so the awareness is definitely getting out there and, you know, people sharing my posts, uh, whatever it took, you know, I was doing lives. I was doing, I started, a uh, a page on Facebook. I joined, uh, two other army, uh, women and I co-founded Invisible Combat for a little while. And then we decided that like that wasn't gonna work for us because like we were all three of us were located, like one's in California, one's in Virginia, and then I'm in New Mexico. So we decided that like it was too hard for us. So we kind of just uh D and I separated from that and we just continued doing our advocacy work with Lulac and you know, and then just on my own. And uh, I stepped down from Lulac in October of 2021. Yeah. Because all of this was just taking a really big toll on my mental health. You know, I was actively working in advocacy work that was so close to me. You know, I suffered from, um, I helped pass the Brandon Act, which is a suicide prevention bill. And I poured a lot of my personal self into that because telling my story about how um, I was, you know, dealing with the harassment and retaliation and humiliation and intimidation that I went through with my command, I was extremely suicidal, extremely suicidal. Losing my career made me extremely suicidal. And so every time I would go do, do these public speakings, you know, I'm, I'm sharing my experience and I'm reliving it. And after a while that just, it just really tears you down. And I had to take a break, you know, I had to like reset. And, um, it's like, okay, take a break, take a deep breath, you know, come up for air. And then when you're ready, jump back on it. And that's what I did. I took a break for a little while and then I'm back on it now. And I'm back on it now and it and my my mentality is a lot different because over the last two years I've done a lot of work with my trauma. Like a lot of work. And um that's another positive thing uh, that that came out of something so awful, you know, was that I think a lot of us faced have finally are, are facing our trauma. Especially for like us, you know, older, um, older veterans. I'll just speak for myself. I know people get offended when you say they're old, yeah. but um, you know. But for me, I it gave me an opportunity to look back, you know, bird's eye view, and to look at the big picture and be like, okay, I see where this went wrong, where this went wrong, how it went wrong, and. Um, you, you know, I'm able to, to identify that like none of this was my fault. So all that shame I carried for a long time, um, all the anger, the rage that I carried for so long, I'm finally able to let that go because like, I'm not afraid anymore. Like I'm not in the situation anymore. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid to speak up about it either. For a long time, I was afraid to speak up about it because of the fear that I had that I was going to get in trouble. Because it's it's kind of like, you know, like the older generation, you know, like the 60 plus, 60 plus, how like they don't talk about their trauma at all. Yeah, you're kind of told to toughen up. and Yeah, they're just real quiet about it. And they're just like, you know, they'll kind of like acknowledge that, yeah, you know, times were tough but they don't talk about it. Well, that's kind of how the military is too, you know. We don't air our dirty laundry out to the public because we're so proud. 
we're, we're, we're very proud. And what that's done is create just a toxic culture. It, it's created a toxic culture and it's really weakened our organization as a whole because there's no trust. There's no trust and when there's no trust, there's no respect. And if you don't have respect, you're not going to have discipline. When you don't have discipline in the military, you don't have a strong military. So um, I think that we're at a time right now where we're all taking a good look at ourselves. And some are acknowledging and some aren't. So we'll just see where it goes from there, I guess. But we're going to have to figure it out. <laughs> so do you think like with this time, uh, I guess with social media being as big as it is, the Me Too mo movement, do you feel like the country is more, because you hear a lot of instances where women have talked about certain abuses that they've had. Like, mm -hmm. this, like if, you, if this situation would have happened, let's say, late 80s, do you think it would have been harder for you to kind of get, peop to get people to kind of pay attention? It did happen. 30 years ago. Um, look up Tailhook. There's a huge, huge, huge scandal of, I think there was like 80, 81 or 83 women, um, military women assaulted over a weekend at a conference, at a, at a officer's conference in Vegas. Yikes. Yeah, it did happen 30 years ago. And I'm so, just now hearing about this. Oh, I know, right? Yeah, look it up. Tailhook. Just that's all you got to do. Tailhook, <laughs> and articles will pop up. And it's it's a um, it's kind of like people just. I feel like they don't want to talk about it because they just. I, mean, I don't know. Like, are we in denial that it's happening? Like, I don't understand it. But 17 years ago. 17, yeah, about 17 years ago, we had Lavina Johnson. Look up Lavina Johnson. Um, we've had women that drank themselves to death because of the, their assault. And we've had women commit suicide. I mean, a year ago, we had Asia Graham in at Fort Bliss, Texas. She committed, uh, died by suicide a year, the, the one year anniversary of her assault. And I feel like, what is it going to take? That's like the only question I've got is what is it going to take? Because social media has been blasting it, right? We've passed laws in the last two years. Um, there's been like this movement that's been created, but what's being changed? I mean, it's, it's so minuscule that like, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take. I really don't know. So it's kind of like, almost like you, you, you see movement, but the move is not moving anywhere. Right. It's, it's movement, but it's kind of like, like my movement, right? <laughs> I'm going a hundred directions, but I haven't moved anyway. I haven't, gone anywhere i feel like that's how it's been for the for this sexual assault movement in the military i think everybody's aware of it now right like for the most part um but we, we still have problems i mean you can look up like the jagnet you can look on the jagnet and see like all of the pending sexual assault cases and there's just thousands of them thousands and thousands of them Wow, and you would think with all with every with all the awareness of it, people like people in the military be more careful mm -hmm. of, or at least a fear of some sort of punishment or something. But it right. But Kevin, would you would you be afraid if would you be afraid of it if uh, you saw that nobody was being held accountable? It would kind of give you like the feels like no, oh, they're not doing anything about it, so I'm just going to keep doing it. I think the attitude is still that because uh, especially amongst the senior ranks because they'll get rid of like E1s, E2s, E3s, even E4s 
he fives left and right. Discharge, 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 discharge. You know, a lot of them are administrative discharges. But you see, like, sergeant majors, you see, like, officers being accused of sexual assault. Those are the ones that aren't getting kicked out. They're, like, being allowed to quietly retire. You know, they'll go, they'll reassign them to an army depot in Alabama so that they can quietly retire. It's, it's, and that's the energy. Because everyone sees that. Oh. See, for someone like myself, it just looks like they may have been gotten, gotten disciplined in any sort of way. But, I mean, with especially now with so much stuff going on, we're looking at one thing, then something else happens, and our eyes go another way. And then while our eyes the other way, we just kind of assume that this situation got taken care of. Yeah, but it wasn't taken care of. Well, it was just, it just moved. <laughs> moved to a fresh new area where it could happen all over again. And, you know, these, these predators are, you know, they're, um, they're repeat offenders. They don't get caught first five, six, seven, eight times. You think what? They're, or, and then they get, they get caught and then they get reassigned. They're not like rehabilitated. They're not born again. <laughs> you just got reassigned. Now, and, and the touch, lower enlisted see that. I want to, like, you also, as being African, you said you've talked to, um, poli- you deal with politicians quite often. Now, is that kind of a, um, can that be a bit like a, Intimidating experience for you at all? No. Um, and the reason why is because, like, they're just people. They're, they're just people. You know, when you, and when you talk to them, uh, and you, you, know, you take all the formalities out of the situation, this is, this is not, this is not a time to sugarcoat and put lipstick on the pig. The, 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 you know, the dirty laundry of this, you know, it needs to be put on the table so that not only can you see it, but you can smell it. And this shit is, this it's not okay. So, kind of like, um, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be a horrible example, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. All right, so January 6th, the Capitol got raided. And the members of Congress that were in that room and you can see the, the security footage of when, like, people, like, busted in. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? And they were scared. And they were under their desks. Right? And I was just like, wow, well, now they know what it's like to be every kid in America in school. And I'm not saying that I agree that that should have happened. You know, I prefer to, like, not even have an opinion about January 6th because, I mean, I understand as a veteran who was completely screwed over by my own people. You know, I understand all that, understand that disgruntledness, but I also understand my my commitment and my oath that I made to serve and protect the Constitution of the United States. So, you know, I prefer not to have an opinion about it, but my, my point is that until you experience it, you're not going to know how to fix it. So I think that people need to, to know, you know, like kind of like the family of Vanessa Kian, how they were so open about, you know, letting her story be tracked live, right? You know, mm-hmm. America found out about what happened to Vanessa the day they found her the same way. I mean, we found, we all found out together. And it was like, people needed to see that because they needed to feel it. And if you watched, you know, the, that day that the news came out, they, they did find her. It was, you know, yeah. they did validate that it was her. And then they did the press release and they said, this is what, what happened to her. You felt that. Everybody felt that. 
and especially the when they thing. gave out the details of everything yeah yeah about how she was you know hit over the head in the arms room with a hammer shoved in a box chopped up burned that's and something buried. a serial killer does yeah burned buried i think ted bundy did Live. something like that that's inhumane like and that and that's why i asked that question okay why is that girlfriend still in jail like why why does she still have a pulse i'm sorry i'm confused <laughs> i'm like and you don't yeah oh no I don't blame especially you. i mean especially because like you you could tell that vanessa was a good troop she was a good troop. I mean, I've, I've spoke to people from her unit and they were like, she was like so nice. Like she, she was a hard worker and you know, she had all this ambition. She was excited. You know, she had wanted to serve since she was a little kid too. And to take that away from somebody is, it's just, it's cruel. It's really cruel. Now and, you heard uh, the uh, Amer- the the Vanessa Gilliam Act, like it's passed now, right? Mm-hmm. Well, like parts of it passed. It was it joined the Military Justice Improvement and Increasing Prevention Act, and um, so in in my opinion, it was watered down. You know, and it's there's still way a lot more work that needs to be done. You know, that was not the that was not the fix all for the problem, but what it did is it 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 uh, it made the military acknowledge how badly they fucked up with that. So that's all the act is basically. It's just almost like a receipt of acknowledgement. Um, I wouldn't say just a receipt a, re- a receipt of acknowledgement, um, but because it did it did remove the command from the investigation process. But there's still so much more to a sexual assault than just the investigation. You know, there's the fact that, like, the, the, uh, the victim still has to serve in the vicinity of their perpetrator. And, you know, the investigation process takes so long. Uh, it's taking... <clears throat> taking a long time to to get soldiers transferred you know it's supposed to be an expedited transfer but they're like taking 40 days there's nothing expedited about a 40-day transfer you know what i mean yeah and and we still have problems amongst the uh sexual assault response coordinators because there are some they're called sarks there's some um sexual assault response coordinators out there that are the are the actual perpetrators or they are protecting their buddies that are the perpetrators. I had a situation just a month and a half ago, uh, an E5 young lady from Romania, she was stationed in Romania, uh, reached out to, uh, found me through the, I have like a, I have a little underground operation going, (laughs) but she found me on Instagram, not my, not my personal page. I have a, an anonymous page set up and she told me that she was she had gone to the SARC to file a complaint and that he was trying to convince her not to file the report because he knew the guy. He knew the guy and he's like, Oh no, he's a good soldier. If you do this, it'll ruin his career. It's like, no, if he he ruined his own career by sexual harassing someone. So that's a problem. You can't you can't report a problem to the problem. You see what I'm saying? So if you were making like the um like a perfected version of this bill, what would all be in be in this? You know, I would look at the uh the feedback that the military uh community I would take into consideration all of those things. Like right now, if uh, one of the things that they wanted to put in the bill was the, the ability for 
a victim to get a cash settlement for their assault. And it's like a hundred thousand dollars. But the problem with that is that if you accept, um, you know, a separation pay payment like that, you have to pay it back when you when you file for VA compensation. So, oh, so they yeah they get you one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. So they, so many so many things, you know, are are, are part of that. Um, but uh, I I. I I honestly just can't say what, like, if, if it were up for me, if it were up to me, I would do this, this, and this. I don't know all those answers, but I would definitely reach out to, you know, like, women who have been, uh, like, you know, grassroots organizations that have been doing this, you know, helping to write these bills or that did contribute. I would look at all their suggestions, right, and take in, and just and give things perspective, too. Think about it. You know, you got to like really put yourself in a situation where is this going to hurt or help the system? So, but definitely taking the command out of the investigation process was huge. I think that the situations need to go completely out of the, out of the unit period, out of the state. So who do you think should do the investigation? Um, a, probably like a CID agent outside of that base because, okay, I'll use my case as an example. I filed a EO complaint in my state. It went nowhere. In fact, that's what made it worse. So then I went to the Department of Defense, right? I went all the way to the top. I bypassed National Guard Bureau. I bypassed Department of Army. I just went straight to Department of Defense. It's DOD IG. DOD IG gets my complaint. You know, they, they take forever and a million years to look at it. And then they notify the Department of Army. Hey, we got this complaint. Department of Army notifies my state, contacts my state IG, the New Mexico IG, and says, hey, we got this complaint that Crystal Romero filed. We need you to look into it, conduct an investigation, and then get back to us. So it's kind of like they're snitching on you. So then, yeah. So then now, my state gets to investigate themselves, and, you know, naturally, they're not going to find that they did anything wrong. Then they're going to report that back up the chain. DOD gets it looks at it, oh, okay. And in my case, you know, several senior leaders gave false testimony. So they're like, oh, well, the colonel said this didn't happen, so it it must not have happened. Oh, the general said this didn't happen, so hmm, that must not have happened. Unsubstantiated case closed. That's, in a nutshell, how it works. So sexual assault, same thing. Sexual assault happens, go to the SARC. The SARC then, you know, they've got protocols that they've got to follow, whether it's a restricted or unrestricted report. Um, You know, military police will have to get involved because, like, a a military protection order, it's kind of like a restraining order, will have to be put in place. You know, we might need to move the victim. We might not need to move the victim. We might need to move the perpetrator. They usually don't move the perpetrator. But then it's like, but then the um, the command is notified, and then they they assign an investigative an investigative officer. But the officers are all peers. You know what I mean? Like yeah. So if I get something and you and I are peers, and I gotta investigate you, and like you and me are homies, how do you think that investigation is gonna go? <laughs> And you see, you see something like that in, in I think we've probably mentioned this before, in all types of industries. Like, so I yeah. never understand why you have somebody. I've never heard a, a, a situation where a person had, or a company or an entity has to investigate themselves. And they're like, yeah, we fucked up. Like, they, they rarely <laughs> ever hear that. No, no. At best, you'll get there was a misunderstanding. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was told that, um, cause I, I reported a HIPAA violation. I was told by like a medical professional, uh, the state surgeon that it was a learning experience. Oh, <laughs> Wait, did they tell you that, or is it like in a document written somewhere? Oh, it's written. It's See, that written would infuriate somewhere. me. It's... Oh, oh, trust me. <laughs> oh, trust me. I wrote, I wrote it. A... You follow me on LinkedIn, right? Yeah. Okay, so just a couple of days ago, um, I'll go tag you, or I'll send you the post. But I wrote about my HIPAA, my HIPAA violation experience. So read it and give me your feedback because. Um, you know, and the reason why I share my story is because I need people to understand that it's, it's, and it's also a way of like vindicating myself, you know what I mean? Because people need to understand that, that there's a lot of abuse of authority that happens within the military, you know, and these, these commanders just feel like they're above the law. Like they can just do whatever they want because they're the commander and it's not right. It's not right when it's used for bad. It's not, it's not right when it's used for, you know, to cover up situations. I mean, there's, there's times where commanders have to make decisions that are going to make a positive impact. And usually, usually those just, you know, those decisions are, you know, can, can benefit the organization. But when you purposely cover up wrongdoing, all it does is just leak more poisonous fluid into the pool. You know what I mean? Like it just weakens the organization and we're creating our own mess. We're, we're creating this toxic environment. We're doing it to ourselves because we're choosing to take the path of least resistance instead of, facing the problem, like you said, acknowledging, okay, just acknowledge that you fucked up. Like what's the worst that's going to happen. Right. (laughs) Now, do you think that, um, like telling your story, like, have you gotten any push pushback at all? Like other military members, like maybe gaslighting you a bit on your DMs or something like that? Um, no, honestly, I've gotten a huge positive response. Um, a lot of, there's even a lot of like um, senior officers and general officers that follow me on LinkedIn and have um, messaged me on LinkedIn and said, you know, I really appreciate you sharing your insight because it's, it's giving me perspective on, on situations that, you know, might come my way or, um, or seeing it from your perspective really put into, um, you know, really gave me a different thought process. It made me think I, I've been told that my posts are thought provoking and, and that's really what it's about, you know, cause I'm not out to slam anybody. Like I'm not out to ruin anybody's career. Um, do I think that the op- the officers in my situation should be punished? Absolutely. Without question. I mean, I think that at minimum they should, you know, even though, even though they're retired, I think they should lose rank, which means they will lose pay. Absolutely. Um, So even like in retirement, they could, if they lost or can, can you lose rank while retired? Um, because they're, um, officers, they can be recalled back to active duty to stand court martial. Oh yeah. I mean, just because you retired doesn't mean you can't be called back to active duty. They can do that for UCMJ for the part of the military justice system. And um, so, you know, right now the Department of Army is, the IG's office is reviewing my case. Um, It's taken me 10 years, but I finally got them to approve it. And, um, you know, now, now all I, all I can do is just like leave it to God, right? Like, okay, it's where it needs to be. I've given all the facts and there's no way that they look at everything that I've presented and say, yeah, we made the right call. There's no way. 
Now, you telling your story, is it somewhat of a, um, because you you say you deal with PTSD and everything. So does that help you with that as well? Is it kind of like a freeing for you? It's very cathartic. Um, Because like I said, I'm able to look look at things now, like, you know, take a step back and look at it from as a big picture, right? And I can see that it wasn't my fault. Because at the time, when everything was happening, I was made to believe that everything was my fault. You know, even even how I was acting at the time. You know, when I was going through all that, I was, I, oh, I, hell yeah, I had an attitude. You know, hell yeah, I was um, very aggressive or, you know, um, probably displayed uh, some disrespect here and there. But... My life was literally being torn apart right in front of me, and I was just forced to take it. I remember being verbally reprimanded by a colonel in front of a of an air, uh, an army colonel in front of an Air Force E nine sergeant major, and he yelled at me. He told me that I was the most unprofessional NCO he had ever met, and he was mad at me because I wouldn't lie during an evaluation being conducted by Guard Bureau. I had brought to his attention that his um, personnel, the lieutenant that worked in personnel, had had pencil whipped some numbers and had, you know, and I said, I, I was like, it's not right. And when I run my reports, it's going to show on my report. And then, and then what? Right. Like, yeah. And um, he he says, you know, he had told me, uh, don't point anything out unless it's brought to your attention. It's weird wording. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to comp- I'm not going to compromise uh, or dishonor myself or my integrity for you. Sorry. But because he so conveniently outranked me, I had to stand there and take it. I couldn't say a word. I just stand there and listen to him yell at me, telling me that I was the most unprofessional, non-commissioned officer he had ever met. And all that did was just make me so angry. But I couldn't do anything, right? Because he he outranked me. I'd stand there at attention and just take it. So if you heard this um, term, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. I'm sorry, say that again? I've heard of this, um, this phrase. I forget who said it, but it's like, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Mm-mm. The ba- uh, Basically, the premise of it is give somebody power, they'll tend to use it to their benefit. Oh, wow. Well, I had, yeah, I never heard that before, but yeah. <laughs> so how true would you say that would be for military? Oh, very much so. There's a lot of, um, of senior leaders that use their rank as a shield and use it as, you know, a key to open whatever door they want. But also, there's a lot of really good leaders out there that that don't do that and that really do um, pour into their troops and, you know, for to build a better force. So, you know, it's not all, it's, it's, it's like anywhere you go, you know, like when you talk about the police, you talk about how the police are so corrupt, right? Are they, I mean, not every single police officer is a douchebag and, um, not every single person in the military is a douchebag. Do we have douchebags? Yes. But think about how we recruit. Okay. Let's think about that. The military go they go into the lowest of income places to find their recruits you know they go into like you know the barrios with, with their fifty thousand dollar enlistment bonuses and yeah. you know wave it in our faces like hey come join the military we'll give you fifty thousand dollars and you who's never seen fifty thousand dollars in your life because um, your family makes probably like 30000 a year, and that's like your entire family, that 
do you know that's how they that's how they, they that's where they go to get a lot of the recruits so what what else is in those neighborhoods gangs drug dealers rapists thugs you know there's there's good people in those communities but there's also bad people and um if the military doesn't break you of all those things and you know turn your life around for the good then you go into the military as a criminal you know there's criminals like the have you heard that phrase do you want to go to jail or do you want to go home <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> well it's like do you want to go to jail or do you want to go to the military you know a lot of people are given that option so course they're going to go to the military so great now we've got like a, a guy that just committed a crime in our ranks so yeah it's it, it's it's a lot to think about because they're i mean how do you prevent it right well they're not going to start recruiting from public from um private schools they're not going to start going to the private schools because yeah. those people those parents are like hell no stay away from my kids and fifty thousand dollars don't mean much to them uh, right, like it does now. That's I give my kid that uh, as an allowance every year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those kids go to West Point. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now let me ask you this: Have you uh, thought of kind of like some activists have gone to try to take like political positions? Is that something you've thought uh, about at all? I have absolutely no desire to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, not at all. So you don't see no. any you don't see any situation that would lead you to that. I'm sorry, I just nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. You know what? Like I, you know what? I like being an underdog. You know what I'm saying? Like I like being able to move. Uh, be you know be a little free agent <laughs> I don't like being controlled by institutions by money by um, beliefs you know the right or the left um, I've got a family that's in Congress and I just I see how it I see what it does I see how it works and I'm not interested <laughs> so there, there'll be no Mayor Romero in the future. Oh hell no! <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even like the sound of that. <laughs> nope. So, nope. As I wrap this up, I uh, wanted to ask you just um, kind of about the military. Do you still miss it at all? Oh my god, every day, every day. I do, absolutely. And, and that's, and that's where a lot of my depression comes from is that, you know, I do, I, every day I grieve the loss of my career. The, you know, the military to me was like my love of my life. It was, it was where my happiness was. It was where my safety was, my security. Um, and, you know, that was, it was all ripped away from me. And especially cause I wasn't able to reach my goal. I had set a goal for myself that I was going to be a command sergeant major and I was well on my way. And so I do, I miss it. I miss it so much. So um, what goal do you have for yourself now? Um, right now I'm just trying to keep myself from going over the edge. <laughs> My goals now are to keep myself alive, to keep myself going. My goals now are to, um, it's my job. I've got three young ladies that I've got leadership development to pour into. And so my goals are to provide guidance for my daughters so that they can survive in this world that's like just pretty evil there's a lot of bad in the world and I want to prepare my daughters for it in the best way that I can and um, once my youngest daughters who are going to be starting high school this year once they graduate 
um, I'm hoping by then my case will be substantiated. Um, I can go ahead and correct my military record. Uh, the restrictions that I have will be lifted. And then I would really love to do philanthropy work. I would love to do that. Um, I've, it's always been something that I've done. Even when I was in, I was always raising money for my troops because, like, I get it. I mean, nobody knows the struggles like the people that started at the bottom. And I know what it's like to be a single parent and have three kids and have a career to balance. And um, so being able to create, you know, programs and, and help those people out would be, like, really fulfilling to me because I know how much, like, I would have appreciated it and how much it would have helped me out, right? It's like being a single mom, it's like, man, come on, one thing could be easier. It's oh, so yeah. nice. You've, you've got a full plate. Yeah. So that's what I would like to do. And, um, and also, one other thing that really makes me happy is traveling. I love traveling. I want to get back to doing that. Uh, it's been two years since I've... You know, made, made an entry in my blog. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, I want to do that again because I just, I love seeing other cultures. I love seeing other, you know, just other people's way of thinking, other pe people's way of, you know, their beliefs. And, you know, just learning about other, just other cultures. It's always just fascinating to me and, you know, I respect it. So I'd like to do that. But, um, but mostly I'm going to stick with my number one goal, and that is to continue to work on my trauma, you know, processing my trauma, um, owning it, and learning how to um, control my triggers and stuff. Because, you know, my triggers are my responsibility, and my mental health is my responsibility. So right now, that's just the biggest thing for me is continuing to work on myself and making sure that I stay on the right track and, and then, and then help other people, you know, uh, you know, adapt and overcome and then go help other people get through it. That's really how we, how ultimately how we've all been keeping each other alive, like veterans. I mean, the, the military community, we really do rely on each other to keep each other alive. Uh, whether it's through humor, whether it's through retreats, whether it's through groups, whether it's through, um, you know, podcasts, all that stuff, right? It, it's keeping that connection. It's the power of connection. So being able to be a part of that and, for, you know, give that out is, is it's fulfilling. It feels good. It's a feel good. So do you still like, feel like a soldier? Oh, man, I, I, once a soldier, always a soldier. I will never stop being a soldier. <laughs> even how, even with, with every, even with everything how it is, you still feel like a soldier. Absolutely, yeah. No, I haven't. I have never stopped being who I am, and that's part of who I am. You know, that's why when, um, even now, like when I talk to, uh, you know, I keep in touch with a lot of my former leadership. Um, not, not, not the bad ones, okay. Obviously, not them. Yeah. Their no, numbers are blocked. Rules. You know, but uh, like my, my sergeant major, I still talk to him all the time, all the time. He still to this day mentors me and he retired 12 years before I did. <laughs> or nine years before I did. But um, uh, I still refer to him as sergeant major. Uh, when I see uh, or talk to any of my former commanders, I still call them sir. <laughs> And the first thing they say, don't say that. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I was institutionalized. Like, you're not going to take that away from me. <laughs> you can't unlearn it now. You can't unlearn it. Yeah. And then, you know, there's some things that you have to unlearn. But I hold on to the things like that. Um, I still keep, I still mentor soldiers. I do. I still, uh, I've got quite a few that I still keep in touch with and that I mentor. I, you know, I talk to them all the time. I help them. You know, I give them advice on like what schools to go to, what, you know, if they're in school, I give them advice on like, you know, how to, 
study and how to get through it or you know soldiers will uh will dm me all the time on instagram and you know thank me for what i'm doing and then they'll they'll say like oh well i'm having a hard time and then before you know it like you know i'm kind of like mentoring them which is fine i've i've always enjoyed doing that and um it's amazing to see what um just taking the time to talk to younger soldiers as a, as a senior what that does i mean especially when you tell them like hey man that was awesome like you're doing a really good job they're like really and it motivates them and then it motivates them to do better and to keep going and um and that's ultimately what leadership development is and that's something that I've always enjoyed doing so yes long answer absolutely <laughs> so I, i'm just thinking like the way you talk about like being a soldier and i've heard other people in the military talk about it in a way like a NFL player or an NBA player talks about being in the being in majors like there's no thrill there's just something that when you leave there's just something you don't you never really get back it just it never really feels the same it doesn't even just the relationships that we develop in the military you know i still Um I'm still good friends with my battle buddy from basic training. You know, her and I um and that was 25 years ago. But the bond that we have because of the things that we have to do and the level of trust that we have to have for one another, you don't get that anywhere. Um I wouldn't even I wouldn't even say that like even that of like police, they don't They have a bond, but it, I don't think it's anywhere near as close as ours. Once a soldier, always a soldier. I would like to thank Crystal for speaking with me today, and I thank you all for listening to another episode of Talking Business.